Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at slavery in the first century, part of our class in New Testament backgrounds. Slaves were property. They could be bought, they could be sold, they could be owned. They had no personal rights. Uh, they could own property themselves, but they were subject to the whim of the master. Um, they were subject to both corporal and capital punishment. A, a master could could beat them. He could kill them. Uh, although, since they were property, it would, it would be like taking your car and getting mad at your car and destroying it. Um, you might be thought of as foolish, but you're not usually going to be arrested for that. And the same thing was true of slaves. They could be sexually exploited. Um, without, without their permission, they had no say in the matter. Uh, they could not testify in legal proceedings except under torture, <laughs> and and then uh, they could be uh, they could be tortured in order to find out you know what they knew, um, but only in that caveat. Some slaves had been taught to read and write, and as such, a slave m might be educated. Either might be educated before he became a slave, um, or he might be educated once he was a slave, so that he could be used as a tutor for for the master's students, or for some other purpose, or just to, to better serve the master. In the same way, you might uh, uh, again taking the illustration of a car. You might take your car and and have a new engine put in. Uh, the car has no rights, but you are doing that so that you can have a better car. And so a slave might be taught to read and write so that he would be a better slave. Slave names. Um, slaves didn't have right to their own names. So you have, uh, for example, a number of names were just numbers. Uh, Prima, uh, Quatero, uh, Quintus. We're actually going to see some Quintuses. Uh, secundus just means second. Uh, Septimus. Uh, Sextus, these are all slaves' names. Tertius, uh, you, you actually see a Tertius in the New Testament. Uh, Tertullus was another uh, slave name. And then Gaipor, Lucipor, Marpor, Naipor, Olipor. The, the, the word poor is just boy. Uh, so Gaius, for example, but uh, the, 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 the word uh, poor attached to it was a, just meant, meant the boy. Uh, Lucipor, the, the light boy, the boy of light. Um, and so uh, Marboy, the, the boy of the sea, uh, and the water boy, I guess you might call it. Uh, Philetus, the beloved, these are all slaves' names, and you come across them from time to time in the church and even in the pages of the New Testament. Romans chapter 16, verse 22, I, Tertius, that's a slave name, who writes this letter, and notice he's the one who's actually writing the epistle to the Romans. Uh, it's authored, you say. I thought Paul was writing it. Paul is dictating it. Tertius is doing the actual writing. So Tertius, evidently, who had a slave's name, uh, is able to read and write and to pen this letter. And, and notice, <laughs> in the middle of Paul's epistle, um, he says, I, Tertius, who writes this letter, greet you in the Lord. So he includes his own greeting to the Romans, and then Gaius, host to, the, to me and to the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, greets you. And Quartus, that's another slave name, the brother. So here's, here's two slaves, one that's actually writing the letter, and another who's called the brother. <laughs> um, so he's a slave, but he's also a Christian brother. And he adds his greetings to Paul's greetings in this epistle to the Romans. Now, how did one become a slave? There were a number of ways. He might be captured in war. He might be kidnapped and sold as a slave. He might fall and find himself falling into debt. And this was true of both Romans and Greeks and even Jews might sell themselves into slavery in order to repay a debt. You might have uh, someone who was born as a slave where a, a, a slave might, have a, might be given a, a wife and they come together, and they have a child, and that child, because both of his parents are slaves, is now a slave him, himself or herself. You might have a baby that was exposed to the elements. It's what I refer to sometimes rather jokingly, but it was no laughing matter, as uh, a post-birth abortion, where a child that was unwanted would be taken 
taken and left and exposed, and anybody was free to go up and pick up a child like this. Uh, here, oh, here's a baby. Uh, what am I going to do with it? Well, um, you might take it and raise it as your own, or you might take it and raise it in order to be a slave. And so um, these would become slaves. Ethnicity was not an issue. It wasn't a black issue or a white issue. You could have a uh, a, a white slave owning, I'm sorry, a, a white master owning a black slave, or you could have a black master owning a white slave. Um, ethnicity, uh, whether it was Greek or Roman or Jewish, that was not an issue. You sort of lost your citizenship if you became a slave because you became, in a sense, sort of a non-person. Luke chapter 17, beginning in verse 7, um, sort of uses slavery as a illustration. Notice that Jesus says, Which of you, having a slave plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, Come immediately and sit down to eat? No, if, a, if, if you're out working the field and you have a slave and the slave comes in, you don't say, uh, you don't take care of your slave's needs. You, instead, verse 8, but will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink. And afterwards, you can eat and drink. See, slaves didn't have rights. They weren't treated uh, respectfully. They, they were treated as slaves. And it was assumed that a slave serves the needs of his master first, and then he's allowed to serve his own needs. Now he goes on, verse 9, he does not thank, that is the master does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So you too, and notice how Jesus is likening his hearers to slaves of God. He says, so you too, when you do all the things that are commanded you, ought to say, this is the idea, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. And so a slave uh, has duties. You don't say, oh, this is a great slave because he did what he was supposed to do. No, that's expected of a slave. If he doesn't do what he's supposed to do, he's going to be either beaten or killed because he's useless. Now, Caligula, um, notice uh, this is, comes from the pages of Suetonius, who is the biographer of a number of the emperors. He writes this book called The Twelve Emperors. And speaking of Calig Caligula, he says, at a public banquet in Rome, he immediately handed a slave over to the executioners for stealing a strip of silver from the couches, with orders that his hands be cut off and hung from his neck upon his breast, and that he then be led about among the guests, preceded by a placard, giving the reason for his punishment. That's a harsh punishment, and slaves could be punished harshly. Now, what's interesting is in the slave parables, there are certain parables that Jesus told. We looked at one where he's likening people to slaves. That, that's, there's no surprises there. But these are parables in which the action of the slave brings about an unexpected result, a very you know, where, the, where the parable changes and turns the whole societal structure on its ear, almost turns it upside down. One of those is Luke chapter 12, verses 35 and 36. Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. This is Jesus telling disciples to be ready for the coming of the master. Be like men who are waiting for their master. So notice somebody who's waiting for a master is himself a slave. When he returns from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Now, that, that part, there's no surprise. Um, the master goes out. The slaves have to be ready so that when he comes back in, uh, they can be ready to meet him and greet him. However, here comes the the surprising part, verse 37, blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. Truly, I say to you that he, that is the master, will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and will come up and wait on them. That didn't happen in the ancient world. And yet that happens with God where the Lord serves the slaves when they have been found faithful. This is an unexpected result. Another unexpected story is found in Luke chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. Now, he was also saying to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager. Manager was, of course, a slave. And this manager was reported to him as squandering his possessions. What's going to happen to this unfaithful manager? And he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an accounting of your management, for you can no longer be manager. You're going to be demoted. 
verse 3, the manager said to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I'm removed from the management, people will welcome me into their homes. Maybe I can get a position uh, somewhere else. Verse 5, and he summoned each one of his master's debtors, and he began saying to the first, how much do you owe my master? Verse 6, and he said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. He's giving him a 50% discount. And then he said to another, how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. Now what he's doing, he's, he's giving a break to the debtors, but it's not coming out of his pocket. It's coming out of the pocket of his master. Verse 8, and his master praised the unrighteous manager because he had acted shrewdly for the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. Now, that's unexpected praise. We don't expect to read that. We expect to hear, and he called the slave in, and he cut off his hands and hung them around his neck, uh, sort of like what we saw with Caligula. But instead, he praises him. Why? Not because of his honesty, because he was acting dis dishonestly, but because he thought ahead. He used foresight. And so notice it's a, a parable where we're called to look at this. And this isn't saying we're supposed to try to cheat God, but we are called to use foresight and to think ahead and to plan for the future, not a worldly future, but a heavenly future, because, because we ought to be more shrewd in relation to, the, to our own kind than the sons of light. Now, here's a letter that's written from Pliny, uh, Pliny the Younger. He was a governor. We, we see some other things uh, written by him, actually. He was, he was in the process of persecuting Christians, but this isn't about that. Instead, he's writing a letter to uh, Sabinian, Sab Sabininus, uh, and he says, Your freedman whom you lately mentioned as having displeased you. So here's a former slave. He's not a slave now, but he'd been a former slave. Um, and notice, whom you lately mentioned as having displeased you has been with me. He threw himself at my feet and clung there as with as much submission as he could have done at yours. He earnestly requested me with many tears and even with the eloquence of silent sorrow to intercede for him. In short, he convinced me by his whole behavior that he sincerely repents of his fault, and I'm persuaded he is thoroughly reformed because he seems entirely sensible of his delinquency. Apparently, he had done something, not as a slave, but as a free person. But because now he's free, he still owes loyalty to his former master. And that is expected of a freedman. He goes on to say, I know you're angry with him, and I know, too, it is not without reason, but clemency can never exert itself with more applause than when there is the most just cause for resentment. You once had an affection for this man, and I hope we'll have again. In the meantime, let me only prevail with you to pardon him. No, we don't know exactly what it is he's done. Uh, but he goes on, if he should incur your displeasure hereafter, you have so much the stronger plea and excuse for your anger as you yourself, as you show yourself more exorable to him now. Allow something to his youth, to his tears, and to your own natural mildness of temper. So Pliny is actually interceding on behalf of, of this freedman. He goes on, I'm afraid were I to join my entreaties with his, I should seem rather to compel than request you to forgive him. Yet I will not scruple to do it, and so much the more fully and freely as I have very sharply and severely reproved him, positively threatening never to interpose again in his behalf. It reminds us quite a bit of a letter that Paul writes not to somebody who'd had a freedman, but to Philemon, who'd had a slave who apparently had been unprofitable. He goes on, but though it was proper to say this to him in order to make him more feel fearful of offending, I do not say it to you. I may perhaps again have occasion to entreat you upon his account and again obtain your forgiveness, supposing, I mean, his error should be such as may become me to intercede for and you to pardon. In other words, um, I'm not planning on this happening again, but if it does, then then uh, I've, I've still left space for some further reconciliation. And then he says, for what? We don't know uh, what happened at the end of that story.
Now, manumission is the act of setting a slave free. And sometimes slaves were, on occasion, it didn't happen a lot, but sometimes they were set free. It might be a reward for loyalty. It might be that they purchased their freedom and a, a slave was allowed to, to save up money. Maybe he may, could work on the side and make a little bit of money and, and save up enough so that he could purchase his freedom. After all, uh, the master had a vested interest in holding on to him, but, but if the price was right, he might sell him even to himself. The term man, manumissio uh, means sending out from the hand. So uh, you were under the hand of your master, but now you're sent out and you're, you're no longer under his hand, and that means you've been set free. The free man who's now been set free is to wear a uh, peleus. So you see a picture of one sort of a cloth cap. It's, this cap is given as a symbol of manumission, a symbol that this person now is free. He was formerly a slave, and now he has been set free. Freed Roman slaves became citizens, but it was sort of a second-class citizen, but still it was a, a citizen. Uh, only This only happened if the master himself was a Roman citizen, and such a freedman was not permitted to hold public office, but he, he now had certain rights as a citizen. Um, he was expected to show continued loyalty toward his patron, uh, he was no longer doing it as a slave, he was doing it as a freeman, but he would be at his ma his former master's beck and call, uh, so much so that he might, uh, the first thing in the morning, he might go to his former master's house and, and be there just, do you need me today? Uh, can I do a service for you? And that was expected, that patron uh, privilege was expected. Children born after manumission could hold public office. So uh, here, here's a freedman. He's been set free. And now he has a child. Um, and that child uh, has greater honor and greater rights than his parents did, even though uh, they're both, they've both been free. The child of a master and a slave could be freed, but could not be adopted. You see, there was a, uh, there, there was a a big difference between masters and slaves. Uh, there was a social distinction that was insurpassable. Now, you have a revolt that took place in 73 BC. It lasted for a couple of years, the Spartacus Revolt. Uh, Spartacus was a gladiator, and gladiators were, uh, they were slaves that were trained to fight in the arena. And uh, not, every, not every gladiatorial combat would end in uh, a death, but it could. Um, and so uh, he had been trained to fight, and he led a revolt of other gladiators. Um, they, um, they managed to get a, a number of slaves who ran away and, and became part of their revolt. Um, they uh, pillaged up and down Italy. Finally, finally, the revolt was put to an end as the Roman armies came against them. And as a result of this, the, uh, the gladiators... Uh, were crucified 20 miles of crucifixions uh, leading out from the city of Rome uh, were there. And uh, Spartacus himself uh, was, was killed. We don't know exactly how. Was he, was he one of the crucified? Uh, did he die in combat? We're not sure how. Um, now, slavery in the first century then, in, see, that was Spartacus. He was, he was in the first century B.C. When we come to the first century A.D., we've had what we call the Pax Romana, uh, where there was a period of relative peace beginning with the reign of Octavius Augustus, the first Roman emperor. This, he comes after Julius Caesar. Um, and the, the fewer wars led to fewer slaves, because after all, if one of the ways that you become a slave is you're captured in war, then we're not, doing, you know, we're not having that many wars. Um, now, Octavius Augustus then decreed that no slave could be freed before the age of 30. Um, they were beginning to have a shortfall of slaves, and he wanted to make sure that, that they didn't lose all their slaves. There was a 2% sales tax on slaves, uh, which would induce you to either uh, to hold on to your slaves or maybe not be quite so quick to sell them. Uh, the laws of Claudius, he comes in 41 AD. He's 
Remember, he's the one who had ordered all Jews out of Rome, and as a result, Aquila and Priscilla uh, end up coming to Corinth and meeting the Apostle Paul. He decrees that the killing of a sick or old slave becomes murder. You have to, uh, you can't just kill them. You have to, uh, you know, you, you could maybe set one free if you don't want to take care of them anymore. But really, you would, you would probably take care of them so that the younger slaves could see that and and maybe more be apt to serve you and not try to, uh, to do something that would bring about your demise. Uh, the abandoning of a slave, so you, so you can't kill him, but you could say, okay, I'm not going to take care of you anymore. Uh, that, would, that would legally set him free. And so um, you weren't guaranteed to take care of this old slave. If, if, he beca- if, if you didn't feel like doing that, you could just uh, uh, abandon him and he would be set free to fend or to starve uh, in, his own, in his own right. The sales tax under Claudius was increased to 4%. Um, he, well, I look at the sales tax uh, here where I live, and it's actually higher than that, so that was not considered uh, too extreme, I suppose. Now, one form of slaves were the eunuchs. Now, the Hebrew uh, saris, Uh, That's the Hebrew word for eunuch. It's mostly found in the book of Esther, but you actually find it going all the way back as early as Genesis. In fact, Potiphar is described with this term. That doesn't necessarily mean in his case, because the term could be used of a a technical eunuch or somebody that was uh, just given to serve the king. So it it can be a eunuch or it can mean other than that. Uh, The Greek term uh, eunuchos, uh, where where we get our English word eunuch, the echo part, uh, the akos, uh, echo is to have, uh, somebody who holds or has something. And the une is a word for bed, so one who holds the bed. Um, and, of course, uh, a eunuch was, was um, sometimes required to uh, take care of the women. Um, and because he was a eunuch, he's not going to be able to seduce them or have intercourse with them or anything like that. Um, a eunuch would normally be made a eunuch when he was very young before he hit puberty, so that as he hit puberty, those manly features, the growth of beard and so uh, those things might be retarded uh, or not even come into being at all. So a eunuch was uh, not just sexually dysfunctional, but also gender dysfunctional uh, in that right, because it had normally taken place before uh, he or he, before he hit pu- uh, puberty. Now, we're told in Josephus, in his uh, book, The Wars of the Jews, that Herod the Great had eunuchs in his court. Um, Matthew chapter 19 and verse 12, Jesus speaks about how there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. Uh, that's the sort of thing that he's speaking of. Notice there, there are some that, I, I guess, a uh, a, a child might be deformed or something like that. That's what he's speaking of at, at the first uh, mention. And there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He's not saying they necessarily cut off uh, their their uh, uh, their gender specific parts, but rather that they had decided to abstain and act as though they were eunuchs to to not be married, not engage in any sort of sexual conduct. Uh, notice for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, and then he then he adds, and he who is able to accept this, let him accept it. Not everybody's called to do that, um, but if somebody uh, wishes to, and I've known people who did not get married and who stayed sexually pure, so that. Uh, they could better serve the Lord. And and that's that's a good thing. Now, there's a story in Acts chapter 8 about a eunuch that is met by Philip. Philip is sent uh, down the Gaza road. Uh, and there, there he meets a slave. Um, chapter, Acts chapter 8, verse 27. He got up there and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official, you say, well, she was a court official or a slave, and, and the answer would have been yes, um, because he was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Kandaki. Now, you say, wait a second, don't you pronounce that uh, Candace? Well, not if you're reading it in Greek. <laughs> so, uh, Kandaki, the queen of the Ethiopians, and Ethiopia was, was uh, far up uh, uh, if you, you know, when I want to say up, I don't mean uh, north. I mean, if you go up the Nile River, 
uh, far to the south, you get to the land of Ethiopia. And apparently, this this uh, eunuch, and notice he's called an Ethiopian, he's called a court official, but the passage is going to refer to him after this, after his introduction, as a eunuch. That's, again, marking the fact that he was a slave and, and had been made one, probably made a eunuch when he was, when he was very young. So uh, not only is he a eunuch, I would imagine that he is sort of uh, gender confused. Uh, and he's going to encounter Jesus. Acts chapter, uh, 20, uh, chapter 8, verse 27, um, he goes up and meets this eunuch. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 1, we're told that no one who is emasculated or is a, his male organ cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. And he had been to Jerusalem, but he had not been allowed to enter even the court of the Gentiles because, because he was considered deformed and excluded. And so he goes up, and, and there's this, this Ethiopian eunuch, um, notice, who was in charge of all her treasure, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. So he's, he has now with him a scroll of the book of Isaiah, verse 21, 29, then the Spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Verse 30, Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said to him, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how could I unless somebody guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Verse 32, now the passage of the scripture which he was reading was this, and now we're told the section from which he's reading is from Isaiah chapter 53. Here it is. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearers is silent, in humiliation his judgment was taken away. But here's the part that he, that he stuck on, middle of verse 33, who will relate to his generation, for his life is removed from the earth. Now that phrase, his generation, when we look at it in the New International Version, the same verse, in his humiliation he was deprived of justice, who can speak of his of his descendants, his generation, his seed. And, and here's this eunuch who doesn't have a generation. He doesn't have any seed. He doesn't have any descendants because that's been taken care of rather permanently. And he's reading about somebody that's being prophesied of, the Messiah, the, the, the servant of the Lord, wondering, gee, here's somebody like me who also cannot have any children. Who, and so the question comes up, who can speak of his, his generation? Now, I'm not, it's not saying the Messiah is a eunuch, but the Messiah, it's, it questions about his descendants, his seed. Who are his seed? Because his life was taken from the earth and he wasn't able to have children. Well, verse 34, the eunuch answered Philip and, and said, please tell me of whom does this prophet say this? Of himself, is Isaiah speaking about himself, or of someone else? And Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from the scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Because it's speaking of Jesus, who had no physical children, but who becomes, in a sense, the spiritual father of us all as we trust in him. We are born again. We have a new life. And so, therefore, he tells them about, about this way to have spiritual children. And at the end of the story, the eunuch says, I'd like to enter into this. And, and Philip takes the eunuch and baptizes him. And I like to think that the eunuch, after his baptism, went back home to Ethiopia and bore an entire nation of spiritual children. And the reason I say that is because we know from church history that later the, the nation of Ethiopia would become essentially a Christian nation as they gave themselves in faith to Jesus as the Messiah. 